Now chapter 27 is a great tragedy. It's a tragedy with long lasting consequences. But it's also a tragedy for Jacob, the man who plays the trick and the man who appears to win. It came about, chapter 27, verse 1, that when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see, he called his older son Isaac and said to him, My son, and he said to him, Here I am. Isaac said, Behold, now I'm, I'm old. I do not know the day of my death. Isaac actually is going to live a lot, a lot longer, but he doesn't know it. Take all your equipment, your bow and arrow, go to the field and hunt game for me. Make dinner for me, verse 4, the dinner like you know I love so that I may eat it. And so then my soul can bless you before I die. Now, Rebekah heard him say that to Esau. So when she went out to, when he went out, when Esau went out to hunt, Rebekah says to Jacob, get ready. We're going to make dinner for your father and we're going to, we're going to deceive him. So they prepare the dinner and they also prepare a way of, of disguising Isaac so that he will, uh, Jacob, so that he will feel like Esau and he will smell like Esau, even though he won't sound like Esau. So verse 16 says she put the skins on the hands of Jacob and on the smooth part of his neck, and she made the savory food and the bread which she had made to her son Jacob. Then he came to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. A lie. A lie. So the blessing was obtained fraudulently through a lie. God was going to give him the blessing anyway. God gave him the blessing before he was born. God had promised it to him. But Jacob would rather steal the blessing by lying than wait on God to give it to him. Now, I'm going to tell you one of the three most embarrassing things in my life. And it gives me great, great pain to tell you this. But I'm going to tell you this to illustrate the story. There's no way you can understand, unless you live there, what a special thing it is to celebrate Christmas in America as a child. It is the best and most wonderful feeling that anyone could ever remember. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And what happens is that the child is told that Santa Claus will come to his house on the night before Christmas. That when he goes to bed, there won't be any, any gifts there. But by the time he wakes up, Santa Claus will have brought the gifts and left the gifts. And when he wakes up, he can open the gifts and enjoy the gifts. And that whole season of Christmas is the most wonderful time in a child's life, by far, by far. Well, by the time I was a nine or ten years old, I had guessed that probably it wasn't Santa Claus who came down the chimney into the fireplace with the gifts. That probably it was my mother and father. But there was a great riddle and a great mystery, and that was where did they hide the gifts? And I searched the house and could not find the gifts. And then one day, in a fit of demonic inspiration, I guessed where the gifts were. I guessed that they were in the trunk of the car. And in those days in America, we left our keys in the car. We never do that anymore, but we did it then. And so when my father was downstairs in his shop working, and when my mother was busy in the kitchen, I went out to the car. And I took the keys out of the ignition and I went to the trunk of the car and I opened the trunk of the car and there were all the gifts. And I felt like Adam and Eve after they ate the fruit. Uh-oh, now what have I done? 
So I close the trunk of the car, and all my life I have had a, a mechanical clumsiness with my hands. I can't do anything mechanical. And it showed itself very early. And I could not get the key back into the ignition of the car. I fumbled and I tried. I couldn't do it. So I finally I panicked. And I just threw the keys up on the dashboard of the car and left them. About an hour later, my mother came in and sat down beside me. And she said, your father says that someone has been in the trunk of the car. And I said, it wasn't me. So she left. And about 20 minutes later, she came back and said, your sister said that she didn't do it. Now, my sister was three years younger than me. And there's no way my sister could have done it. And I didn't have any brothers. So there weren't a lot of suspects. It was pretty obvious that I was guilty. So I burst into tears, and I admitted that I was guilty and that I'd done it. Later, my father said this to me. He said, we've tried to teach you many things, but we never tried to teach you to lie. And then he said, we work hard to make this a special time for you. Now, I ruined Christmas. I ruined it that year. I ruined the best thing in the whole year. I ruined it in two ways. I, I wanted to take something early. I wanted to see something early that my parents were going to give me anyway, that my parents were going to show me and, and give me anyway. And I lied. And that's what Jacob did. Jacob wanted to take something early that God was going to give him anyway. And he lied. He lied to get it. Now we can ask the question, well, what if, what if Jacob had just let things go on and let Esau come back in and let Isaac bless him? Isaac would not have blessed him. God would have intervened in a righteous way before Rebecca and Jacob intervened in an unrighteous way. When we take things prematurely, we get less than we would have gotten if we'd waited on the Lord to give it to us. And let me just make an obvious application. Sex is like that. You want it so badly that you're tempted to take it early. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord's timing. Wait on the Lord's choices so you can enjoy the maximum benefit of what the Lord wants to give you. Jacob didn't do that. And he bought 20 years of trouble for himself. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. Genesis 27, after Jacob and his mother Rebekah have prepared the bread of deception for their father, it says that uh, in verse 18, Jacob came to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Two lies. He wasn't Esau and he wasn't the firstborn. I have done as you told me. Third lie. Isaac didn't tell him to do it. He told Esau to do it. Get up, please. Sit and eat of my game that you may bless me. Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God caused it to happen to me. Well, in a way that's so, but in another way, 
That's a dangerous and guilty thing for Jacob to say. In a way, he's taking God's name in vain because he's saying that God is God caused the lie. God is blessing the deception. Isaac said to Jacob, Come close that I may feel you, whether you're really my son Esau or not. Now Esau was very hairy and Jacob was very smooth. So Jacob came close to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob. Remember, his mother had put the hairs of animals on his hands. But the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his, hand were, his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. And he said, Are you really my son Esau? Giving him another chance to tell the truth. And he lies again. And he said, I am. So he said, Bring it to me, and I will eat of my son's game, that I may bless him. And he brought, brought it to him, and he ate. And he also brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Please come close and kiss me, my son. So he came close and kissed him, and when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. And then he pronounces a blessing to him, and he says in verse 29, May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you, and blessed be those who bless you. Now, as soon as the blessing was over and Jacob left, Esau came in and asked his father to eat. And Isaac says, Who are you? And he says, I'm your son, your firstborn Isaac. And then Isaac, and then Isaac began to tremble violently. And he begs for another blessing. The writer of the book of Hebrews talks about this situation in Hebrews chapter 12. Isaac said, Your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Is he not rightly named Jacob? The word Jacob means supplanter, the one who takes the place of another. For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. That's not quite true. Esau sold him the birthright. And behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Well, he's, he'd already given away the blessing because the blessing came with the birthright. Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Now, again, it's hard for us to understand why Isaac can't just change his mind and say he got it through deception so it doesn't count. But the words of the blessing are permanent. You can't get them back. When my son was about three years old, He was in my arms and he was holding a helium balloon, what the Germans called a Luftballon. We were in Germany. And when we walked outside the house, my son let go of the string. And when he let go of the string, the balloon went up into the sky. And he asked me to get it back. And I couldn't get it back. He thought his father could do anything. And when he realized that I couldn't get it back, he cried and cried and cried. He was inconsolable. And Esau says to Isaac, get it back. Can't you still bless me? No, he can't get it back. The blessing had been let go. Now it was on Jacob and he couldn't get it back. That's how binding and permanent and indelible a spoken blessing was. It's like letting go of the helium balloon and it goes up and you can't reach it anymore. It's gone. It's too late. You let it go. Esau let his blessing go to his brother. His father let the blessing go on Jacob and it couldn't get back. Esau could never get it back. Though it says in the book of Hebrews, though he sought for it with tears. Now basically as a result of this, Esau says, when our father dies, I'm going to kill my brother. That's what he says in verse 41. And Rebekah knew that he said that. And Rebekah reported the threat to Jacob. 
Now, Jacob is thinking about the difference between him and Esau. He's thinking, you know, I'm just a guy, I'm just a normal guy who hangs around the kitchen. My brother's an athlete. He's a hunter. He chases down wild animals and he kills them. He chases down animals who can run faster than me. If he can chase down animals who can run faster than me, then he can chase me down. If he can kill animals, he can kill me. So I only have one hope. I've got to get a head start. That's what Rebecca thought, and that's what Jacob thought. So even though their father wasn't going to die for a long time, and even though he wasn't even sick, Jacob had to get out of town. So Rebecca says in verse 43, Obey my voice, arise, flee to Haran, to the place where I came from, to my brother's house, my brother Laban, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides. Now, why did Rebecca want e Jacob to have the blessing? Because she liked him more than Esau. Why did Isaac like Esau, want Esau to have the blessing? Because he liked him more than Jacob. The parents disagreed. One liked the older brother be better, one liked the younger brother better. And you can know for sure that if Rebecca loved Jacob more, she loved Jacob's company and she liked having him around. And she believes that Esau's anger will only last for a few days. Because Rebecca did it her way instead of God's way, she lost her son for 20 years. Because Jacob did it his way instead of God's way, he lost his mother and his father and his brother for 20 years. Now Jacob is going to have a long, long lesson. Jacob's about to go to school for 20 years. And he's going to learn some hard, hard lessons before he ever sees his family again.